recording. And is that it? There we go. Okay, everyone, can you all see the uh, PowerPoint again? So welcome to uh, our West Africa virtual tour, stories, culture, music, food, and more. Um, I'm so pleased to introduce you to Molly King, who on my screen is underneath me, but she just waved. She's got a beautiful embroidered purple shirt on. Molly, um, Molly and I met during the pandemic on Zoom. We have actually not met in person, but when the pandemic started, we're both part of the Oregon Recreation and Parks Association. And there is a subgroup that is uh, the senior centers of Oregon Recreation and Parks Agencies. And those staff started meeting on Zoom to try to share experiences of how to try to continue to operate during the pandemic. And that's where Molly and I met on Zoom and realized that we had both spent time in Africa and got to talking about that and thought it would be really fun to share with a bigger audience. So here we are today. Hopefully one day Molly will get to meet in person. Um, and um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Natalie and I work at the Ashland Senior Center uh, as the, the program coordinator. And Molly, would you please introduce yourself to us? Yes, I am the recreation manager for the city of Troutdale up um, in the Portland metro area. We're the gateway to the gorge as you're heading out east um, along the Columbia River. It's a very windy city in the winter time today. It's lovely actually no rain and uh we had some pretty good storms uh monday like hail and you name it it kind of all came through so the weather is a little tricky out here but otherwise good and uh, i've been in the field for recreation for about 25 years actually directly following my time in africa um, i've been serving uh, in government ever since in the recreation field happy to be here Okay, well, let's get going on our virtual trip. Um, come on, slide. There we go. Okay, so here we are um, just to, we want to help situate you all as to where we're talking about. So can you all see the mouse here, the cursor moving on the screen? So this is a political map, and then we want to show you the uh, geographical map as well. But we will primarily be talking about Mali, where I've spent time, and Niger, where Mali did her Peace Corps for two years. Um, and you can see that these countries are really pretty um, savanna. So it, they're not, the Sahara Desert is in the northern part of the country here, but the, bother, the bottom part is a little bit um, more fertile and green, um, a lot of grassland, but they're really transitional places and they're very big countries um, with quite a lot of diversity and very rich and interesting history. Um, so we, we did wanna narrow it down to just West Africa because we're not gonna talk about much of the rest of the continent. Um, and, and here is a, a closer map of, um, of where we were um, and so I primarily spent my time around Bamako, the capital city in Mali. And we'll talk a little bit more about what brought us there. And, and Mali, you were kind of around here in the Difa region. Yep, so we were kind Difa of on area. opposite ends, as far as away as we could be with me over in the Western part of Mali and Mali right on the border with Chad here. Oh, sorry, what, someone's in the waiting room. I just let them in. Um, and okay. And then here is a beautiful map of Niger where Molly can, Molly, you can um, move the mouse also to show people where you were um, and where you traveled to while you were in Niger. So, um, and just talk about your pictures. <laughs> Great, yes. Uh, so I was in the Difa region. There's seven regions in Niger. So the very, very farthest Eastern part um, yeah, my mouse isn't working, so great. Um, you can see the distance, the capital city, if you want to shoot over there, Natalie. It was a quite a haul, two days in a car um, to get there to that area. And I worked in the Difa area, the Ngigmi area, back over there. And then my actual town that you'll see a little later with a sign is called Mani Sorwa, and just to the left of Difa. Um, this is a picture of me out in front of my... Um, house uh, in the village I lived in, Mani Sorowa. 
Um, Molly, do you want to tell us when you went to Niger and how long you were there? And so what, I went, what you were doing? yeah, so I went as a Peace Corps volunteer. I went to college 88 to 92, and I literally walked the stage and got my diploma and caught a red eye flight to Philadelphia for my training for the Peace Corps for three days and then flew into Niger, West Africa. So I was uh, 21 years old, uh, 22, and was there from 92 to 94 as a Peace Corps volunteer. So two years and two months. And uh, yeah, I don't know if you want me to talk at this point, uh, Natalie, about um, a little bit about- um, No, why don't we hold that until we have some photos to match that story? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Molly. Um, and here's me. So just to show you that you can see Niger is right next to Molly here, but I didn't go there and Molly didn't get to Molly because inter-Africa travel is extremely challenging. Um, and I did most of, um, so my time in Mali was based on research I was doing in graduate school. I, I went to Boston University about, it's over 10 years ago now, and was studying African history and decided that I really was interested in the history of Mali. I'll get into it a little bit more, but they have a very fascinating, fascinating to me anyway, medieval history that I wasn't aware of growing up. You know, I didn't learn about this until I got to the graduate level. Um, so I went on two trips in 2007 and 2010, spent my entire summer, so three months, about a total of six months to do language learning and research um, around Bamako. Um, I tried to travel a little bit and I'll tell some stories about that later, um, but really, um, was in a much more urban environment than where Mali was. So we've had a lot of fun comparing experiences that way. Um, but I've always been interested in uh, Africa. Um, I actually did my bachelor study abroad in 2001 in Cameroon. And I was thinking about including some of that in here, but we had more than enough material <laughs> with just these two countries. And as a child um, in the 1980s, from about the ages of five to nine, my family actually lived in Nairobi, Kenya, over in East Africa, because of my father's work. So I had always kind of wanted to return um, and did that through um, study abroads and things like that. So this picture here is, I think, from my 2007 trip with um, some of the family members of one of my language teachers. And he took us to his um, more rural village, which was great to see. Um, and they're pretty nicely dressed up. I'm trying to, the, the woman in pink is wearing what, like a boo-boo outfit. So I have mine on for you here today. Mm. It's a very nice airy outfit that I could just put on top of my regular clothes. <laughs> and Molly and I were both thrilled to find these clothes again and thinking it's a shame they've been just sitting in boxes. We should, we should wear them more often. <laughs> um, and travel, so. Um, Molly has some good stories about overland travel in Africa, and so we just wanted to show you some of um, what the roads look like. This is not, a, is it a paved road, Molly, with just the dirt that, on top of it? I think that's one of your photos, and that, oh, that doesn't my look photo. paved. Yeah, it does not look paved. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, that was actually going to the, the, the village where the picture I was just in with my teacher's family members. But these are the sort of bus stations you have and these very colorfully decorated buses. This one you can barely see on the top, but it says a la cabon, which means God is great. So that's supposed to be kind of a blessing for this bus so that it doesn't get in any accidents. <laughs> And then along the route, you'll often stop and all these vendors with food and stuff will come to the windows. Um, and then this is, yeah, what it, what a kind of like a <clears throat> more rural road looks at. There's usually not many, very, very many paved roads, maybe one thoroughfare cutting across the country. And the picture on the top left here is one of Molly's. And you said that those were the taxi cabs you would take. Those are the taxi cabs. And in Niger, there was just one paved road um, all along the bottom of the country. And when I wanted to travel, I would try to get a ride with potentially a, um, someone who lived there with a little bit nicer of a car or someone through the Peace Corps, but sometimes I, that wasn't possible. And so I would just take public transportation. So these taxis would wait until they were full. And so you, uh, you waited a lot just for the taxi cab to fill up and to be very crowded and hot. 
And then you'd finally leave midday <laughs> to get going on your travels. And it was quite a journey, not very comfortable, but you were always grateful to be able to start moving at some point and start moving towards your destination. Yes. And I don't know, Molly, if you had people bringing livestock on, I think they had kind of stopped that a little bit by the time I was getting on, but goats and chickens and. That did happen. Yes. That was not, nothing really surprised me after a while. All sorts of things <laughs> were transported for sure. Um, but so it takes a brave person to attempt this kind of overland <laughs> travel, um, which is part of the reason why I think, you know, we, we, spend a lot of time in the specific locations where we're doing our work. And I will say um, just one interesting thing for me with travel is where I might have a purpose and a mission to get going at a certain time and I had to be very patient. Most people, you know, this was a, like a, a joyous thing for them to get to travel and maybe they weren't working their farm for the day or whatever it was. And so everyone was usually in a really good mood, you know, just happy to just be not in a rush. I mean, I think, you know, they'd always kind of look at me odd, like, why are you in a rush? You know, so I had to it's kind of a interesting mentality. <laughs> yeah, very different way of thinking about things. And we, we have to, you have to correspondingly adjust your own attitude in order to make it. <laughs> yep. um, and so we want to show you some pictures of where we were. So this is pictures of Bamako, the capital city of Mali, and I'm not sure I haven't looked up statistics, it's probably about a million. It's um, not terribly large, but uh, you can see in the middle here in the background, a big river that bisects the city in two, and that is the Niger River, if you have ever heard it, which is a very significant river in West Africa that starts, I believe, in Guinea in the highlands and then goes all the way down um, uh, down into the Atlantic in Nigeria. Um, but obviously a lot of places around there have been named by it and it's a big thoroughfare for historically for trade and things like that and a big source of local identity. Um, and so there's always a lot of construction going on constantly when I'm over there, um, as you can see in the bottom left picture here and on the bottom right. Um, is uh, there is a big hill on the edge of town called Kuluba, which literally means big hill, and all the French colonial offices used to be up there because the temperature is a little cooler. Um, and uh, now the current government offices had moved up there, and I had the privilege of going up there because that is where the older archives were, and it's great views to see the whole city when you're up there. And you can see it's it's quite green down here, not what you might picture for um, like the Savannah Sahara region. Um, and then this is Niamey, Niger, the, the capital of Niger. Yes, so I was not there very much. My training in the Peace Corps was nearby about um, just not that far away, but basically I only was in Niamey, the capital city for some random training. So not a lot of time spent here, but you can see a picture here of a really um, large mosque uh, that were was present. And then also a picture of the river, also the Niger, uh, and just a beautiful sunset. I didn't see a lot of water when I was uh, there, but so this, and then in a way, I was thinking about this picture because it really didn't astound me, which it probably does a lot of people who live there when they don't live near water, but I'm from here, the Pacific Northwest, and I'm used to seeing the Columbia or whatever. So, uh, but it is a, is a very beautiful picture of a sunset. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, and then these are just some sort of typical uh, scenes of what the streets look like. So this is in Bamako and a very nice paved road here. Um, one of the things that is very characteristic to me of um, the whole African content is the redness of the soil. It's very clay rich and this very red color soil that is really striking when you're there. Um, and I don't know, in Mali, a lot of the buildings are painted this kind of light pink color. And I think they do that because if they build them white, they're gonna turn this color anyway with the dust. So you might as well, you know, go ahead. But it, it's lovely to see there's so many bright colors there and a lot of pink and a lot of men, women, and children all walking around in pink and purple. And 
things that we don't see quite as much here where I think um, those colors are more restricted as to who can wear them appropriately. Um, and then this is, I did get to travel to one town that was um, a little bit north of um, Bamako in Mali, which had much more traditional architecture. And it's also on the Niger River, and it's a sort of a historic capital um, from historic empire that we'll talk about later. But you can see that they have these really cool, they are mud buildings. Um, so they use uh, wood scaffolding. You can see the poles sticking out here and then make mud bricks and then cover it all in mud. And that needs to be resurfaced again um, annually because they do have a rainy season every summer that can deteriorate the buildings. As you can see on the right here, that one has started to deteriorate and you're seeing the bricks that are underneath that mud covering that they put. Um, but I think it's really beautiful architecture and something about the armory downtown in Ashland kind of reminds me of this architecture. So that's what I think about every time I walk past the armory. <laughs> um, and a lot of pottery. So there's a whole tradition of working with the earth and clay and things like that. Um, and then this is a, another image of what a more rural location would look like. So people live in these family, um, compounds where there are multiple houses for people to sleep or kitchens within the compounds, especially for polygamous households. Mm -hmm. Usually if a man has multiple wives, each wife has her own kitchen and her own sleeping area and things like that. Um, and uh, I just thought it, I, I really liked how it was nice to sit out in the courtyard here. I think the structure here is for chickens. Um, there's always shade trees like this that you can um, park yourself underneath and then very friendly villagers who, for some reason, people always like to play with my hair when I was over there. I think that the, the straightness and the length of it was fascinating to them. And I'll get into that a bit more later. Um, and then um, this is from that same village. I just wanted to show all the women um, gathered together after they prepared the food. Um, they're dressed pretty nicely, kind of their Sunday best. And then this is uh, their their kitchen. I My research when I went over there was on food and cooking. I was really interested in that. Um, basically trying to do kind of a culinary history of this part of the world. So really kind of hanging around kitchens and women cooking a lot and just being annoying with my questions until they kind of let me in. So that's, there will be a lot more pictures of women cooking and me hanging around them coming up. <laughs> and um, this is from Molly's trips because I didn't see anything like these pictures where I was at. So the first one, the, um, the sand dunes is near Ngigme, which was that far, far east side of the country and uh, breathtaking, just beautiful. A uh, very tough environment, though, to live in, uh, but absolutely gorgeous, for sure. So I had a chance to be out there. And then the giraffe, uh, one of my highlights of my trip coming home, I was almost to Niamey, probably about an hour away. This is as I'm literally leaving the country. And we saw a herd of eight giraffe uh, right off of the paved road. And we stopped and just spent some time. It was amazing. I don't even know how to describe it, but it was sure a gift to see. So of course, this is a landscape you're seeing that was not common where I lived, but uh, closer to the capital city and a little bit more of a um, some vegetation. And Molly, is that desert the Sahara? I believe so. It's just north of Ngigme. The desert is there. And we didn't have to travel far. There's some more pictures coming up that show a little bit more, but um, yeah, it was right there. It's not like we walked very far to see that. Okay, they're right, right here. And there they are. So we got to take a camel trip. Uh, it was a three-day trip. And I'm actually not someone who's ever even ridden a horse. And it was quite something to ride a camel. And I ended up walking quite a bit um, for a lot of the the trek, but it was three days and that's another Peace Corps volunteer and we hired um, some folks to take us out and I actually did a second trip with a couple others that came out from the West, um, some different Peace Corps volunteers that wanted to see the desert and uh, it, it was incredible. They are incredible animals and you're really high up in the air when you're on them. So. 
Okay. Um, and then this is, um, again, these are more village scenes and this, these are both my photos and Molly's photo, but um, this is uh, now an Islamic region, you know, they have been converted, even though that didn't, was not fully completed in, I think Islam arrived around the ninth century in West Africa before Christianity um, and was the foundation of um, a lot of the later civilizations. But um, at least the group that I primarily was living with, uh, the Bamana or the Bambara in Mali, resisted conversion to Islam until about the 19th century. And they still have a lot of um, traditional animism mixed in with that. But now it's across the board, you know, there's little mosques and madrasas everywhere. So this is a mosque in a village. Um, and then this is where the students would learn. These paddles here are wooden tablets that students, male students would practice writing um, uh, passages from the Quran, like this young gentleman here is doing that Molly um, captured that, you know, that is pretty uniform across our area. Um, that he is writing some passage from the Quran probably. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the population would be literate in Arabic because of that, but maybe not in other languages. Yeah, that's true. Did you wanna speak about the picture a bit more? Yeah, no, it was uh, kind of him to let me take a photo and pose yeah. for that. I think he, he probably felt honored, you know, to have me take the photo as well. Yeah. Um, and then here, just in relation, these are uh, men in Mali who are getting ready to do one of the five um, daily prayers that you have to do as a Muslim. Um, and so that was something that I was able to take a picture of and witness and women would be praying in a separate area. There's a pretty um, pronounced uh, bifurcation of uh, it's a very gendered society where men kind of hang out with other men and have their male sphere and women hang out with other women and have their female sphere. Um, and then this is some more pictures just of the Niger River. This is a river crossing, but you can see it is a significant waterway. So it's really um, a bringer of life. Um, in in Bambara, the language they speak around um, Bamako, it's, it's uh, the Niger River is called Joliba, which can be translated to mean that it's like the blood of the area, because that's the same word for blood. Um, and this is the Niger River from a little bit further up. And this is very traditional boats that they use with these long sticks to sort of pull themselves up the river. Um, there's still some fish in there. And historically, there were a lot of crocodiles and stuff. But um, I think they're a little, the waters might be a little overfished by this point. Um, and this is what it looks like um, in the houses there for at least for our experience. So this is whenever I traveled to Mali, I stayed with host families. Um, and so they were always generous to give me one of their rooms, which is very bare, but it's very clean. Um, and again, they have the house is built around a courtyard and a lot of activities take place outside. You know, if you don't have electricity and air conditioning inside, then you spend time outside. And there's often a tree planted outside, which in in this area is often a mango tree. So, and they're very proud of their big and juicy mangoes. They do have exceptional mangoes. Um, and the top of the house is flat with roof access. So people spend a lot of time on the roof. When it's hot in the summer, you could be up there sleeping. You can dry your laundry up there. Um, people plant gardens up there. Um, and it was a great view to kind of see the rest of the neighborhood that I was living in which is kind of a residential part of the capital city. And then this was a very good bathroom setup because it had running water. It wasn't just a toilet bowl sitting there that you had to pour water into. And while there was no hot water, it was still very nice to have it, you know, to be able to take a shower like this was really a treat. I did, don't imagine Molly that you had such a fancy setup where you were. <laughs> so here's a, uh... The town I lived in, Maini Sarwa, so it's on the paved road as you're heading in. And I think the sign is interesting uh, with the 30, I think that's uh, kilometers. kilometers. Yeah, so that's metric system. 12 miles an hour or something. <laughs> um, and this is actually inside my main living area. I So for the Peace Corps, 
the way that a town can have a volunteer is that someone provides housing um, for the volunteer. I ended up going to this Eastern region and lived in a larger town and I was in an Africare project. It was a little different. This was a large town and then a lot of my work was out in smaller towns. But so the richest man in town had just built a new house. And so I got the old house, which is a cement um, house with four rooms. It actually had a bathroom. It's, it's very simple, um, but it was very nice for the area. And we did have running water maybe half the time, but no shower. I mean, there wasn't, no, none of electricity was questionable. So I mostly did other systems, um, it seemed like most of the time, but the, um, but the area was nice, very large just for one person. Um, but again, it was a very, very nice house that I was given in this large town. Okay, and now we're on to markets. So we've got a lot of pictures. I spent quite a bit of time hanging around markets because I was interested in the food. So we're working, we're starting from the outside of the market and we're gonna work our way in. So this are, is a smaller market in Bamako and there, this is another mosque right there in um, the market. And there's all these little storefronts and even some vendors out front. But when we get into the market, you'll see it's, um, almost kind of like a semi-permanent structure here with keeping the, the sun off and all the vendors have their stalls set up and they specialize. And this woman looks like she's selling shallots and you've got your vegetable vendors, um, very female dominated space. Um, and uh, this is the main central market in Bamako. Um, and this is another smaller market. Um, and they just, they. They kind of pop up all over the place. These are, again, all onions and garlic and maybe various kinds of grains back here. The region I was in, they eat a lot of rice um, and also some millet. Um, and I can't really see it well, but there's lots of black spots here. Um, and so those are all flies. It's very hard to escape the flies where you are. Um, and these are market pictures from um, Niger. And I, Molly, I just love the expression on this gentleman's face. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure where these pictures were taken. They might have been in Maine or somewhere else. But again, mangoes, you know, seasonally, we definitely had them. I think there's some herbs there. The gentleman on the left, I think that I want to say cola. These are cola nuts. Yes. Those are cola nuts, yeah. Very, um, I remember that. I don't, I don't think I ever had one, but I remember they were very popular. And, and yeah, I, they're a natural stimulant. And I remember trying them in Cameroon. We didn't really have them in Mali, but it's you, uh, it's something that you chew and it, it's a natural stimulant like caffeine or something. Um, I didn't feel like it was very strong. And I believe it was, you know, one of the one, one of the original ingredients in Coca-Cola, right. but they don't use that yeah. for the Coke part or the, yeah, mm -hmm. um, the cocaine part in it anymore. So, <laughs> um, and then these, I just really like these kind of showing different specialized vendors. This woman is selling vegetables and this is a fishmonger. My favorite here is the butcher who's got the cigarette hanging out of his mouth because I'm sure that's great for food safety and can't really see it in this picture, but the ash is getting a little long. So you're just hoping it doesn't fall on that meat there. But, <laughs> um, but just, you know, people, these this is their livelihood. So, and that's how um, usually from a household, people go to the market um, almost daily to get, you know, the, the things that you're going to use for your meals that day. And then this is some of the, I was very interested in what people used as spices and seasoning and making sauces. So they have all these traditional, um, like, um, preparations they make, like these are kind of their version of, um, bouillon cubes, you know, like chicken stock seasonings. They are, made from um, mostly plant products like ground up baobab seeds and stuff. And then they're fermented and dried in the sun and they are very stinky. Um, but that is that, that so you put a little bit in that um, to season sauces usually. This is um, 
I believe ground up okra, which you put in sauces to make it thicker. This is just dried chopped okra. This is hibiscus leaves that you know can be made into a very red kind of sour drink. These are balls of kind of dried onions that are another seasoning you can use. This is some kind of um, local herb or seasoning. It looks like tamarind, but I don't know what it is in English because I never saw it anywhere else. Um, and these are little catfish type things that are dried and are again used as a seasoning in um, foods. I, I managed to smuggle some of these things when I came back um, from my last trip. I don't have them with me anymore, but because they're so smelly and you're not really supposed to bring agricultural products back, I had like a duffel bag and I took these really smelly ingredients and I wrapped them in plastic and I wrapped all my clothes around them and put them in the very middle of the bag. Um, and they made it through. So then I could subject everyone to my very authentic African cooking when I came home. And here are some mangoes and some tubers and these sticks. It's a special kind of plant where they put it in the water and it kind of cleans the water like a Brita filter does, but it, it gives it a very pleasant taste that I really liked. Um, okay, and these are people at work. So just different, um, I was just, I, I'm interested in what people do and how they live their daily lives. So this, these gentlemen with the donkeys, they are actually um, the garbage truck. They are picking by the trash, which is actually pretty good that there was a system for that. And it's not just thrown out in the street. Um, this gentleman has a little, basically kind of a convenience store. It was just down the street from the house I lived in. So I'd go buy, you know, little bars of soap. You can see he's got these baguettes here but they're cut up. So people would go and just buy part of a baguette, like 20 cents yeah. worth of baguette and have that for breakfast. Um, and you can buy everything in, in tiny packets, like two eggs or you know one cup of oil in a plastic bag, that kind of thing. Um, this is, oh, nope. This is a, a, a tailor or a boutique. Most people um, for their nice clothes, they get them made out of the fabric they want and it's not cheap. If, if people are wearing what you would think of as African clothes, like what I'm wearing and what you see in the shop window, that's kind of their Sunday best because that's very expensive. And then they would just wear, you know, t-shirts and shorts regularly. Um, and then I had the privilege with some of my colleagues to go to the radio station and um, speak on, I don't even remember what we were talking about, but they asked us some stuff. And so I thought that was pretty cool to see what that looks like from the recording side of just one of the local radio programs. And a um, couple more. This is a very nice picture of a tailor and I'm sure Molly used tailors too. I had this tailored, someone gifted me the fabric um, and I knew I wanted one of these big boo-boo outfits. So you just go to the tailor and the turnaround time is extremely fast. Um, and they tend to be all males actually mm -hmm. that are doing the sewing. And here are women, you know, carrying things on their heads, which is a very ubiquitous scene from around Africa. Yes. Maybe going to sell them at the market or, and these are, um, I'll let Molly talk about her work in Niger. Yes, yeah, so this is in Maini Sarwa. And actually when I first got brought out to this town after my three months of training uh, for the Peace Corps, I was dropped off in this village and I actually, my house wasn't ready. And so I actually stayed my first night in the new hospital that hadn't been opened yet to the public. So that was very interesting. And this is the main doctor there. And he was just one of the nicest people I met on my entire trip. And he took care of me and I ate with his family. And um, so that was really great. And then my actual work work was away from this town uh, in the medical industry as well, but we'll get to those a little bit later. Oh, right here. So this <laughs> is, uh, I have some health in my college background. And so I was pulled for this Africare uh, child survival project. And so these photos, the far left and the top uh, right are from a training of some nurses, excuse me, some midwives, and actually you'll see some first aid workers, the men in the back on the left, um, to help them in their small rural villages that were up in different areas um, in the region 
to have their medical supplies um, kept up to get the training that they might need some new things to know. Um, it was a slow project and we did get the training to happen, but it took well over a year. There's just some, some things that took some time, but it was great to have them all come. So these women coming into Maney, the big town from the rural area, this was a big deal. They are dressed to the nines. Um, and you can see their scarving, which I I actually purchased a scarf. I don't know if you can see this, it's just super long. Um, this became a lifeline for me. There are flies everywhere all the time. And so you are covered up quite a bit, even though it's hot. Um, and so this is very, very thin. And so it wasn't too hot to use. Um, so you see, I really see women really draped um, in these different types of scarving. And then the bottom right picture is uh, in another city with some nurses, some trained nurses, and they're just taking a break out front, but they're also dressed um, rather nice. Um, and you can see a smock over the one in the middle. And that is the clinic behind them, right, Molly? Correct. That is a medical, um, a small medical clinic behind them, yeah. Um, and then these are just pictures of people that I would met over there. Um, this is that I was invited to a wedding and all of the, it was from the um, bride side that I was invited. So all the women from that side had to have coordinating outfits. So everyone was dressed in this um, white with yellow uh, birds outfit. And I, that, the picture with me and all the little girls just didn't come out that well, but so that, that was all tailored and all paid for, you know, by the, um, the, the wedding party. Um, this was uh, a woman who put us up for my first trip there when I went to study abroad and her doctor husband, these are pretty well off people. Um, and they had some of their uh, more rural, lower income relatives living with them to kind of do more of the housework, such as this woman, Yausa, who was, you know, kind of did some of the cooking and stuff. Um, and then again, this is a picture from my teacher's family members, but you spend a lot of time with other people when you're there. People are used to just being around each other. There's not a lot of private spaces. So I would usually have to tell people, you know, they thought that I went to bed really early because I would retire at eight o'clock just so I could hang out in my room, read my book, have some quiet time to myself. You know, I'm just like, yes, yes, I need 16 hours of sleep a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then these are from Molly's uh, travels. So with that training pictures from before, those were women and first aid workers that came in from, I think I worked in about eight different villages. There was actually a, a Jeep that came with a chauffeur for this Africare project that would take me out to these tiny villages. And so they all came in from those areas. When I'm in these villages, inevitably I would sit and eat uh, with um, kind of the dignitaries of the villages. And so the elders were usually always a part of that. And just, you know, some really amazing people with so much wisdom and knowledge. And it was a, a joy to get to uh, visit a little bit. I didn't speak the, their language. I could give greetings and we'll get to that later, but there was usually always somebody to translate. And then children, there are children everywhere and they wanna play with you. Um, and so I spent a lot of time, one of the things that you wanna think about if you're going there for a while is what can you bring for children that's not candy or something like that. So one thing that I found that they really like is these little bubbles, you know, the little things you can get at the dollar store um, cause they're fun. It's not something you can find there. Um, they have, you know, an older, uh, child here helping them use it. And another thing that I brought a lot was just origami and just teaching people like really simple origami folds because that was something that, you know, my mother's Japanese so that that kind of felt like something from my culture to share that's fun and interactive um, and doesn't, you know, it's not more stuff you have to keep. It's just paper. Um, and this was uh, my host sister on my last trip, just this adorable girl. Um, and her little cousin here, we would just hang out and play. Um, and then this was 
another friend who took me to see her new niece or nephew and just the tiny, cute, little, tiny baby hands, you know? Um, and then this picture is a little less happy. There's a lot of child poverty. So this is a child who's begging outside of a nicer store. I don't know if you can see it, but he's got this red can here. It's like a, you know, the bigger cans of like canned tomatoes or something. And so they save those cans and throughout the city, you'll see children like this begging or leading around um, a disabled person. Um, so you do see that quite a lot. These are taken um, in Niger and the one on the left, I remember visiting this family and I just thought this picture showed how they would display their dishes. These are all things they can cook in. They're called quanos. And this was a display of their money, really, to a certain degree. Um, she's dressed up very nicely there with all the matching from the same material all the way down. Very young mom. Um, so uh, that was a picture I thought was very interesting of what I saw when I went into people's homes. And then on the right, is two young girls pounding millet. Millet was the food for where I lived. Um, I think throughout most of Niger, especially in the desolate region I lived in, this was it. Everyone grew millet, pounded millet, uh, ate millet. That, and I thankfully I liked millet, so it was. <laughs> um, they would pound it up and get that husk off of it, and then make some type of a porridge, and then the uh, I actually have some quanos at home. The, the big pot on the bottom would have the hot porridge millet in it. And then the, there was a top one, uh, usually the same pattern. And it was cute. They just kind of come together because I was given food and food was delivered to me. And then the top part had the sauce. So then you would just pour the sauce on the bottom part and you would always eat with your hands. It was a very quiet, pretty quick meal. No one talked. Uh, it's very interesting for such a talkative, kind of vibrant people. Food time was just kind of seemed like it was all business and you just ate, uh, washed up, and then you'd start visiting again. So I thought that was interesting. Oh, this is, so I mentioned that I worked with an Africare project. That project um, took a long time to really get going. We should have had the training a lot earlier in my time and then monitoring those folks and helping them along. But since the training took a long time to actually happen, I ended up just doing some other things. Uh, I This is a preschool project that was started actually in the town I lived in, which was really special for me because I always kind of wondered what people might have thought of me in, in the town I lived in because I didn't work there very much. I would lived there and then I would get picked up by this Jeep and taken for the day or a couple of days and then brought back, you know, and they, I don't really think they saw much of the fruit of what I was doing with the villages. So this was exciting. This was in the town I lived in. It's a preschool project. I had the name Rakia. And so on this picture, you can see that um, has my maiden name, Molly M. Young, and then Rakia. Um, Jardin d'Enfant, so preschool. And what's special about this for me is that this was right at the end of my time. And the United States had a program where they would provide two thirds of the cost for something structural like this. Um, and then the village would provide a third of the cost, raw materials, labor, things like that. So this wasn't done when I left. And I passed the baton to a French volunteer that also lived there to finish up and be the, the paperwork person and be that connection. And it was like a year or two after I'd been home and I got mail with these photos and that they had named it after me. My dad is a retired math teacher and he was dumbfounded. He said, they named a school after you and you're not even dead yet. So I thought that was funny. Um, so this was a real honor for me, just that, you know, I hope it's still going. It's been 30 years, you know, but it was exciting to, to see this. And then um, I'll also just mention here, I 
did a garden project. I taught PE because that was my major in college. So I actually taught some PE in the large town of Maine, which was kind of fun. Um, in fact, one day traveling on the paved road out of this town, I heard some kids say my name, Rahia, and I turned and they were all doing like an arm stretch that I had taught them at school. And <laughs> that was really special. It really made me smile. So um, that there was a literacy project that we taught in some, it was actually mostly women and it was in their own language, which was really special um, for them. And then the final one that was also great was a well project um, in a village I didn't even work in. Uh, the, there was an engineer in Maine. It was a rather large town of 10,000. He approached me um, asking for that same piece, like with this preschool project of the, the money, and then they would provide what they could do. And it all went through. They did everything. It was just a wonderful, and it created this huge cement well whereas before in every rainy season, it would collapse and fall in. So there was just some random different projects that I was able to work on and be a part of while I was there serving in the healthcare capacity as well. Okay, this is, I mentioned before how um, I got a lot of attention for my hair. So my hair was quite a bit longer when I went and um, Aisha, the, my host mother, even though she was about my age, you know, we were both in our late twenties, pushing 30. Um, when I contacted them before I came, I'm like, is there anything that I can bring to you, you know, from the U S or that you can't get there um, to thank you for hosting me. And she said, yes, human hair, because she wanted to weave it into her own head and so they can only at that time I think it's probably the same could only get like synthetic hair um so I went on the internet and and bought you know long strips of black hair um the best stuff according to Aisha comes from India because women have long straight black hair there and bought a few packages of that so I could bring her her hair and it's not it's not cheap <laughs> um, but then once I got there when they saw how long my hair was she would always tell me when you're when you're asleep at night I'm going to come into your room and cut your hair off and put it on my head so I um, you know I did cut my hair very short shortly after I came back and I felt bad that uh, I, I couldn't give that hair to them um, because that's really what they wanted, those, those long extensions. And then this is my host sister, Wasana, getting her hair put into, you know, the little braids, um, which is very painful, you know, because they pull really hard because you want it to stay like that for a long time. So she's not having fun here getting her hair braided. And uh, Molly is being a lot more patient here with her beauty applications. I can tell, she can tell you what's happening here. <laughs> yeah, I... I think this was in my, I think this is where I lived and they came to my house and they, this was all a beautification, uh, getting my hair braided. I think it was, I'm actually just trying to remember. I think it was most, many, many braids, but not along my head like this little girl is doing with such short hair where they have to pull so tight. I think it was mostly just starting it off at the top and then braiding all the way down, but many, many braids. And then the, neat part was the henna there. They would do designs on your hand. So they put black tape, kind of that premise where all the black tape would keep the coloring out and then it would create the design on the white space. Um, so for them, especially with very dark skin, all the henna was done on the palms of their hands and on the bottoms of their feet. So it would really show. So anyway, I was having that done with one hand and two feet, and I was so hot here. I mean, I'm <laughs> bundled up in plastic. My hair is like all over me. Uh, it just, yeah, it was, it was tough, but you know, I survived. <laughs> and it was beautiful. It really That's was beautiful. Lovely. And then the, the henna would just naturally wear off, um, which was great. And this is cooking. So there'll be quite a lot of pictures of this because like I said before, this was what I was uh, trying to learn about when um, we went over there. So again, a lot of the cooking takes place outside on these sort of little charcoal things. Traditionally, it would be 
um, I don't know about a picture, but more like what they call a three rock oven where you've got three big rocks and you make the fire in between them and you balance the, the cauldron on top. Um, this is, they're actually steaming something. So the bottom pot is full of boiling water. There's a strip of wet cloth here and this bowl on top has holes in it. I think they're steaming millet, um, Molly, if oh. they could, like, or fonio, if you, the really, really, really small millet. Um, and it, it's a chance, you know, women will spend most of the day out there preparing food and yes. talking and visiting and this she's about to get her hair braided here it looks like, you know. Um, and so these were some of the kitchens from the houses where I was living and this was from a house where I visited where there was just these guinea pigs running around which I asked about and was told that they were just snacks for later. And um, here a woman is, is cooking. I, I didn't show the gross part, but a, a goat had recently been butchered. So she needs a really big pot to, I think she's cooking the head or something in there. Um, and then this is, uh, this was, um, she was kind of the head maid at the house I was staying in, Cecile, a very smart woman who grew up, you know, rurally. Um, and so her really own, only options for work were to be a domestic servant. Um, but she managed to learn French just by herself. Um, you know, if she had had access to education, who knows what she could have done. She was a very smart woman, but because of the circumstances of her birth was limited to, you know, doing this kind of work, but very patient with me as I was always like, what are you doing? She's preparing vegetables here. Here they're cutting like the, the tendons and the ligaments off of the meat. So you don't have to chew that gristle. There's a fish grilling here, pounding onions, stirring the sauce. I would actually sit in the kitchen um, with my little notebook that I wanted to show you. Um, and just write at being asking, what's that? What do you call that? Like, and then write down these recipes, um, just watching what they were doing and taking all these notes, um, which I've, I will, um, I have a recipe that I've typed up. It is for a peanut butter stew, which is a very typical West African dish. And you will be receiving that um, in the follow-up email to this uh, presentation. So if you want to try, you probably have to adjust the portions because these meals are kind of made to be cooked for large groups of people, but it was, I thought the food was absolutely delicious. So here is some of it. This was absolutely my favorite dish and it is um, rice that's cooked in a sauce with the vegetables um, and a lot of oil. So it's an expensive dish that's often made for weddings and stuff because of the cost of the cooking oil. Um, and there's just different varieties. I think, I don't know what meat that is, but this has beef, this one is with fish. Um, this is a delicious um, sour chicken dish with full of onions. And then this is a millet porridge that I know Molly experienced a lot. You can eat it for breakfast, but the time of the year I was there was during Ramadan, the fasting month. And even though I don't fast and I'm not a Muslim, they would still give me this. This is the millet porridge and a special kind of herbal local tea called Kenkeli Ba. And these are the foods that you use when you break the fast after the sun has gone down during the month of Ramadan. Um, and I love this tea. It was very delicious. So Natalie, can I jump in here just for a minute? Um, I also experienced Ramadan and I'm not as interested in food as, I mean, I'm interested in eating food as much <laughs> as the next person, but not in like all this amazing research and um, descriptions that Natalie did. I just loved that food was prepared for me like every day. <laughs> it just showed up and, and it was tasty. Um, but Ramadan was a special time. You know, I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, the food that was cooked during Ramadan was amazing. And it just kept coming and coming and coming because they would fast all day and then break their fast and just eat all night. In fact, some people really didn't lose any weight, you know, <laughs> during the fast because because of that. And I did, I was just going to mention, I did fast for one day. It's the only time I've ever done it. Um, it was, I think it was during hot season. I mean, it's really something because they don't even drink water during the fast. And if you're a true, you know, person doing it, you're actually spitting. So you're not even swallowing anything. I mean, it's just kind of, it was amazing. So I did it one day. Uh, not 30 days, but I do remember the food. And I also remember, uh, Natalie mentioned like the, I remember I was served as an honorary person, 
you know, like the head of an animal um, to eat, you know, and it was like, woo, you know, and I I'm, can't even quite remember what I did, but we, they had a good saying we could use that we're not used to it. And we could say it bansababa and they would kind of understand that. But I would usually try to taste a little bit of something and then say, I'm not used to it. <laughs> um, and here's more food. So this is one of the iconic dishes in Mali. It's a uh, um, Molly talked before about how they make um, a kind of a porridge, and that's typical kind of across the, the sub-Saharan continent that they call them stiff porridges because they're quite hard, like fufu or ugali. So this is made, I believe this is actually made from um, maize corn flour, um, and they're, they're kind of like... Um, it's like a partially cooked pancake or something, that kind of texture, like you, you can break it off, but it's not real firm. And that always comes with two sauces, which is a real luxury because you usually just get one sauce, but it always comes with this red tomato-based meat sauce and this one that I didn't like as much that was slimy and fishy. And <laughs> um, but the complement of having both of those was was good. And this is one of those meals that I really liked. I mean, I I I, I love the stiff porridge, um, and I ended up focusing so much on the sauces that I wrote a whole paper about how they make their sauces because I felt like so much of the literature that I had seen about Africa just focused on calories and the primary starches that people eat and not the really interesting ways that people make their food flavorful or part of their identity. Um, so I do, I do miss this food and I wish we had um, more restaurants. There was a Senegalese restaurant when I lived in Boston and there might be one in Portland, but if either any of you has ever got a chance to try West African food, I highly recommend it. Um, and here's more food. <laughs> this is a very fine grained millet called fonio that's typical to the region that's almost kind of like a very very fine couscous again with a meat based sauce and these are black eyed peas that are a staple diet for a subset of the population where I lived um, and uh, they basically steam them and then you have these sort of marinated onions maybe some meat on top this is a communal bowl that everyone's going to eat out of but you have to eat out of your section. You can't just be, you know, going wherever. And here's the bowl of water for rinsing your hand after you've eaten. And a little bit more food, uh, eating out. Um, this is what they call like a rotisserie. So they are grilling meats here outside and then they chop it up and serve it to you with onion. And again, extremely delicious. These are my, this is one of my teachers and two of my colleagues from one of my trips. And these are Molly's. Well, this one is just to show you if you leave your food unattended, how many, how the flies gather. So that is a bowl of ketchup. So while you're eating, you know, you're constantly kind of waving them off so you don't accidentally eat one. <laughs> yeah. And this is just a, a picture of some street food. It was during the travels, you would stop, the taxi would stop and, and uh, vendors would come out and uh, sell some different food. And so these boys were selling and we called them tubes and rugs, you know, it was parts of like the small intestine or the stomach lining and they were deep fat fried and fried food, you know, it's just salty and delicious. It's amazing. Some of the things I tried, you know, along the way, but um, yeah, lots of flies though. You definitely had to, the, our tip was that we would, could eat something that was hot or recently hot before the bacteria would set in. Uh, so you always had to kind of be aware of that. Yeah, and you stay away from ice because you don't know how clean that water is. I drank have so, access to ice. <laughs> yeah, I drank so many warm sodas. I remember distinctly Yuki Ananas, I think it was called. It was a pineapple. It was a bright yellow, just super sweet, and it'd be warm, but it was something safe to drink. And I drank a lot of soda, warm soda, <laughs> when I was there. Um, okay, and I just I wanted to talk a little bit about the history because I find it very fascinating um, and it's only a part of the history so I wasn't going to talk so much about more recent history because unfortunately there's been a lot of political instability, um, you know, Muslim fundamentalism, political coups, um, and the slave trade affected this part of the world, but what I was really interested in was 
before that, during the medieval period, that there were these huge civilizations there. Um, the main ones are Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. And Ghana and Mali may sound familiar because there are countries today with those names. Here's Ghana and here's Mali. And those countries took their names when they got independence after colonization from these ancient empires to try and build continuity back to you know, the, the pride of that pre-colonial time. Because you can see that the country of Ghana is down here. The empire of Ghana was up here. It had nothing to do with this country. The empire of Ghana is kind of almost up in where Mauritania is today. The Mali Empire, however, did kind of span this area um, and it had, had Timbuktu in it. And I'm sure most people have heard of Timbuktu. It is a frontier town on the bottom edge of the Sahara here. And so the wealth of all of these empires is really from controlling the trade across the Sahara, which was in salt and books and slave and agricultural products and controlling um, the agricultural floodplains along the Niger River here. So, and that's what supported these large states. Um, and this is the house of states here is kind of where Mali is. And um, like the empires of uh, Ghana, Mali and Songhai, they also um, still today Hausa are known as big traders. Um, and I do know that like the northern part of Nigeria here, um, these are all big Hausa towns. Um, and so the, the Hausa have spread a lot, a lot of Africa through trade. Um, and the, as you can see that they had a, a sizable territorial area as well. And there are some other empires, but I just thought it was fascinating to learn about this because we don't really learn so much in school. We learn about medieval Europe, maybe a little bit more about China these days, but, um, but there's a lot of fascinating history from this part of the world too. And one of those things is this mosque, which is the biggest mud structure in the world and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And that is located um, on a tributary of the Niger River in the town of Jene here. Um, and it's, I think it's a fascinating looking structure. It was originally built in the 12th or 13th century um, when Islam first started sort of penetrating the region and then fell into disrepair, but was rebuilt under French colonial rule in 1911. And again, this is one of those structures where um, the mud masons annually have to re-mud the whole outside of that building, but you can see the scaffolding sticking out. So this was one place that I really wanted to see on my trip. And the one time I attempted to take an overland bus from Bamako here up to Jene here, which would have been about an eight to 12 hour drive. So my colleague and I got on one of those buses, like what we saw earlier on in the slideshow, um, and you know, careening down a very narrow paved road where the, our bus driver and the bus passing are passing each other cups of tea out of two moving vehicles. Um, and I started to get really nervous. And then we came across an accident that had happened just in front of us. And there were still um, some dead bodies in the road from that accident. So. I got off the bus and uh, started walking back because I wasn't going to take any more risks. So I never made it to the mosque, but maybe I can still go one of these years because I think that this would be something really fascinating to see that there is not quite anything like this elsewhere in the world. Um, I did go to see a little, this is a little model of it at the National Museum in Bamako. So I can pretend that I saw, saw that mosque. Um, and then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Sunjata. So this is a book, I might put the title also in the email, but um, he is a, a, a hero of legend, but they, based, they can verify that he was a real historical figure. And so he founded the Mali empire that I just talked about um, in the 13th century and united all the Monday clans, which is, that's the ethnic group. And there's a there's an epic about him that's sort of, you know, similar to like the, the Iliad or the Odyssey that has been preserved by being passed down um, in oral um, traditions for, what is that, uh, 1300 years. Um, but the, the traditions of uh, oral history are very well established there. So they can often verify even without written records uh, that this stuff is true. And one thing that I find really fascinating is that around 1235, 
uh, Sunjata Keita created what's called the Kurkan Fuga, which was the constitution of the Mali Empire, which, um, let me just find my notes here. Um, it created an assembly of nobles, or it was created by an assembly of nobles to create a government for the newly established empire. It established a central government and laws of governance. Um, and, um, uh, and that is very much like the Magna Carta, which I think we're all familiar with, which took away divine power from the king and put it on nobles which was established in England in 1215. So really just around the same time that this is going on elsewhere in the world, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so anyway, this book is probably the best known version that that uh, that a historian wrote down of the this epic story of Sunjata, which is pretty exciting. You know, he's the son of the hunchback princess, and then he defeats the sorcerer king to you know, free people from that tyranny and create this um, empire that persisted for hundreds of years and that still is very important in the cultural imagination over there. Um, and this is the griots. So they are, you may have heard about them. They are the oral historians and the musicians um, and they remain really important um, in the music scene today. Um, and traditionally, it, it's a inherited profession. So you're, if you're in a griot family, you're usually matched to a noble family so that that griot family can then recite the noble family's lineage for generations. And these are the people that preserve the story of that legendary um, emperor, Sunjata. And a little bit more about music. So I apologize. It does not work really well on my setup to play music. And um, Molly and I had tested it and found that it was a little hard to hear over the music. Mm -hmm. So I do have some titles in here. And maybe at some point, if we try to do this again in person or something, we can actually play music and um, the show and tell would work a little bit better. Um, but we did have some pictures. This is Molly showing. Do you want to tell us what that is, Molly? That was at a wedding. And so these uh, men were playing, I, I believe, I don't know if it was before or after, but it was a big deal. Horses uh, really show that you have some wealth. And of course, they're dressed very well also. And I thought I'd point out too, their, um, their hats. I actually bought one before I left. I don't know if you can see this okay. Um, I thought this was pretty amazing. This is all embroidery. And the fascinating thing to me about these hats, um, so it's called a hula, and they each are given a name. So this one actually had a name called Dharami, which I thought was interesting. And then also I wrote down how much it was. It was um, three mil, which is $6 in American dollars. So this was back in, you know, 94, but $6 for all this work, pretty amazing. But yeah, so these musicians, I'm guessing maybe afterwards, but I'm not sure if it's before or after. Did, so Molly, who names the hat? Is it the maker of the hat? I believe so, yes. That's really cool. I want to start naming my clothes now. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the privilege to, this gentleman was one of my colleagues when I did a language class and he um, was an ethnomusicologist. So he was looking at a particular subset of music. And these gentlemen are from a group that's called the Hunters in Mali. So they kind of have almost like a secret society that's all men. And traditionally, yes, they do hunt, but they also cross the line into what they call magic, you know? So, um, that, you know, I heard stories, I didn't see it, but that they could tap their stick on the ground and water would come up. So there's a very mystical element and they have a very uh, distinct musical style and these specific instruments that they play. So he had, Theodore had somehow convinced these hunters to come to the recording studio and record them. So I just kind of tagged along because it was a great opportunity for me to go see something like that. And you never know when, I've never had an opportunity to do that again. I knew at the time that that was my one chance. So that was very interesting to see. Um, and then from that, I just want to talk a little bit more about my experience being over there. Um, I went um, several times, and if I include my study abroad, then that would be three research or study trips um, to West Africa. Um, I was fortunate to have two language teachers, uh, 
Kasim is Malian, but he had come to the US to do graduate school. And he arranged for myself, Paul, who was studying art history, and Theodore, who was studying ethnomusicology, to live with him in Bamako for three months so we could learn Bambara or Bamanankan, the local language. And this wonderful gentleman, uh, John Hutchinson, he taught at the university where I was. So he actually connected me with Kasim and they were old colleagues. And he did Peace Corps in Chad in the 1960s and fell in love with Africa um, that way. He's probably in his seven, later 70s now and we're still in touch. We're postcard buddies. Um, but one of my favorite things about John was that he said when he retired, he was only gonna wear African indigo because he loved it so much. Um, and here all the guys are hanging out outside drinking tea, which is what you do. As you can see, um, they're all men here. So uh, it was harder to get in with women. Um, I often, I was even told that I was treated as an honorary male. So mm -hmm. in order to break into groups of women, um, I just had to patiently kind of sit there until they started accepting me. But tradition, because I came there with such a male dominated group and had these male teachers, I kind of, initially was put into a male sphere. And this is Molly's group. <laughs> so this is my group um, coming in for the Peace Corps. There's the country I, Niger would bring in every six months, a group of about 30 trainees, uh, Peace Corps volunteers. And not everybody makes it through. Uh, you know, we lose a, flu a few along the way just for health reasons or homesickness or you name it. But yeah, there I am. We're all wearing these hats we were given that was part of this. Um, let's see if you can see this. Uh, this was a symbol that we were trying to help the families be healthier. So these were, that was part of a training piece. So yeah, so that's a group of us um, there. And then just a couple of my closer friends, I think they came out to visit me or I visited them. Um, Lori uh, was in my group. And I think Jim, as you can see in my group, there are no men because we're all working with nurses and midwives. Um, but Jim came in on a different group. Uh, I think he was, I can't remember what work he was doing, but something different. And here's a couple more pictures. Here's me out in the field, uh, working a little bit with some of the, the midwives. Um, and then also to the right is me and my closest friend from the training. Uh, we lived in the same area. She lived in Difa, the capital city of the region. And so there was actually three of us for this Africare survival project, but the one in Ngigmi, she left partway through. So it really became me and Sherry. So we were really, really close, and uh, she was, we were probably our main support person for each other along the way. Um, and then my dog uh, is on the right, and she was great. <laughs> Love my dog. And who's this, Molly? I know. So this was a friend that I met uh, over there. He actually befriended our French volunteer in the city. Um, he became a, a good friend, and I was able to go to different people's homes. We traveled to Niamey together in the capital city and I could actually enjoy getting to know the culture a little bit more than I ever would have known uh, without going in with him, you know, being, being able to access inside other people's homes and different traditions and cultures um, if it hadn't been for him. And he's an interesting person. He spoke, I believe six languages and at one choice, he had to choose between English and Arabic, and he chose Arabic. So our common language was French, and then a little bit of some, maybe some Hausa, but mostly French. Okay. Um, and this is just me, as I talked about before, this is me trying to get in with the women, because I was interested in women's work. Um, but because I was coming in and studying in mostly a male realm and a lot of the women um, uh, didn't speak French or another language that you know um, a, not, a Westerner or a non-African might speak. So that was another great reason to try to learn more local languages to be able to speak to the women. So I spent a lot of time just sitting out there with them. You know, first I was only allowed to fan the fire because they didn't trust me to do anything else, and that's a job usually given to about three to five-year-old girls, and I still struggle to do it. 
And finally here, I am allowed to peel vegetables. And I think that's as high as I graduated in them allowing me to have any cooking responsibilities. Um, and the other part of my research was that I went to the archives. So I just wanted to show you, these are the two main archives in Bamako, the newer ones downtown and the traditional old ones. This is still a colonial building. This is kind of what it looks like in there. Um, not great system for preserving documents because they come out looking like these. And these documents are only, um, well, a little over a hundred years old and they're completely deteriorated. So I try to take as many pictures and transcribe as much and just kind of collect the data so I could come back um, to the US and synthesize that. Um, and I just, so much fascinating information. This is kind of like French colonial um, talking about, uh, you know, these are rice plains and they're planning for more agricultural development and how much production there is and um, things like that. So, and um, just keeping an eye on the time, the language. So um, the two main languages that Molly and myself were exposed to, I was exposed to, it's in, it's, its real name is Bamanankang, but uh, it's often called Bambara, which I think is what the French called it. And it is primarily spoken in Mali. It's very closely related to things like, um, what's it called? Um, I'm completely blanking. In Senegal, there is a similar language. Um, and I'm, th I'm thinking of Mandingo, because that is a term that I think is a little more familiar in the US from the slave trade. Um, but there are related languages across West Africa. Um, in Mali, the, the dialect that I learned, Bamanankan, is spoken by about 15 million people, but about 80% of those people speak it as a second language because it's a lingua franca in the region. Um, and it wasn't written down until, uh, what well, initially was they use Arabic script to write it down and then um, Roman script. But in 1949, I believe, there was a gentleman in Guinea who created an alphabet to try to use this alphabet for African languages so that they're not using outsider alphabets. Um, and I did learn this briefly, uh, but then forgot it because it's, but it is pretty closely based off of Arabic. The story is that this guy who created the alphabet, Suleimani Kante, it came to him in a dream, but he must have been dreaming in Arabic because this I think is Aleph or the A sound, which just looks like exactly what they have in Arabic. But it was really interesting to learn and it's supposed to do a better job of actually capturing the tones and stuff of the language I never got sophisticated enough to try to do tones as long as people could kind of understand me that was good enough oh and I thought oh I thought I'd just kind of rattle off some Bambra Bamananka so you could hear what it sounds like so I'll say something and then I'll tell you later on what I said uh, so I just said that my name is Jenaba Kulibali, which was my name over there, um, and that I've been to Mali twice to study the language and to do research on food and cooking. <laughs> and Mali can tell you all about Hausa, which is a completely unrelated language that I don't speak at all. So <laughs> well, you have a nice... Uh prompt here about how many. It is the trade language. It's uh, the most universal uh, national language there. The other one is Zarma. So I was in a region that wasn't either of these, but since I was working with um, doctors and professionals, uh, most of them weren't from the region that I was working in as well. So they were brought over from more of a Hausa or a Zarma region. So French was the official language, the government language. So I spoke that. That's part of why I got sent to Niger is because I had some French in my background um, and then also the health background. And then I learned Hausa, not gifted at it. I think it's, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Natalie, I might as well just do my, if we have the, is that the greetings? Yeah, yeah. So, so this was great. So we're writing this up and you can see that um, Natalie has all of hers in her language. Yeah, I don't even remember what it looked like, but I can remember a little bit. So I'll read um, my stuff on the right and say it in Hausa. We'll see what I can remember. I just remember Ina Kwana. So that was, you know, 
basically saying good morning. And the response on that was lahi alo. You would just always say in health, in health, lahi alo. Ina gida, how is your family? Lahi alo. Ina aiki, how is your work? Lahi alo. This one, how is the heat? Because it was really hot. I mean, we're talking, it was 120 plus. You know, I, I learned how to just sit and sweat. You know, you would work in the morning, like seven to noon, you'd go home and eat. And like and have a CS, you'd pass out from the heat, and then you'd go back to work three to six, and you were just a slug. You know, you just sweated all the time. So this one, they actually did say. So it's how is the heat, which I actually can't remember it in Hausa, um, but they would say yes, a quay heat. Like there is heat. It was a it was a thing. Like you didn't deny it. It was all there, and we would talk a lot about the heat. But then like this one, ina gajia, how is your tiredness? You'd say babu gajia, no tiredness. And then you'd go on to talk about how sick your family is if they were suffering from you know, a cold or you were super tired that you didn't sleep last, whatever it is, you, were, you pretty much always said everything was fine. Kind of like we do here. I feel like you know we'll say to someone, oh, hi, how you doing? Oh, I'm fine. But then you go on maybe with your story of how you're not so fine necessarily. So I thought this was interesting. And uh, I did learn these greetings in about three different languages because I was in a Canary and a Fofolde region. And so again, Natalie talked about the language barrier with women, especially nobody spoke a language I could speak. And so I really didn't connect with many women. Um, mostly it was all men um, in my profession. But these, lang these greetings and overall for Peace Corps volunteers, most volunteers really did learn the language in their village and they connected with the people with their language. They were grateful and respected that I could say hello to them in their greetings. And they really appreciated that I was making the effort. Um, and then the other part I thought was very interesting about language, and Natalie and I have talked about this, is because there's so many languages and people learn more than one language, they talk in multiple languages all the time. And so I'm listening to two people talk and it's in French maybe initially, and then it switches to, Hausa and then maybe Kanuri and then you know so I'm getting these snippets of language where I'm tracking it and then they're talking in something I have no idea and then they come back and it's just they don't even notice it they just it's like water it's just fluid and I thought that was really 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 fascinating. Yeah so the code switching is it's, it's um, pretty common um, that they, they're not even aware necessarily consciously that they're switching between languages or using two languages simultaneously, like using a lot of French vocabulary, maybe when you're speaking. And you'll see this other places like with Spanglish or Hinglish, like Hindi and English. Um, and it was great for us, because if you're trying to speak a local language and you don't know the word, just stick the French one in there and they'll probably understand what you mean. <laughs> so, um, But the greetings on my side here in Bamananka are, I just put the literal translation, but the the, the main greeting is Iniche, which literally means you and duty. and you. It also means thank you. So, or actually, if I was greeting you, I should say Aunice because you plural. Um, and then the response you give is different whether you're a man or you're a woman. If you're a man, you would answer ba. And if you're a woman, you'd say nse. Um, and that's literally my mother and the woman again, my duty. Um, and then another greeting you could say is torosite, which is like, you know, is there any, is there evil? And the response would be headed on all. No, no evil, peace only, <laughs> which I thought was great. So me and my colleagues would just go around, you know, giggling and saying peace only all the time. <laughs> um, and then you do have greetings specific to the time of the day, just like how we have good morning, good day, good evening. And that was really um, people appreciate it because I would try to use the right greeting at the right time of the day. Um, and then at the bottom here, I'm not sure if you can see, but negotiating to leave. So it's not that easy. You can't just say bye and leave. You have to start this whole process of like, okay, I, I need to go now. And they're like, oh, you can't leave yet. And no, I really have to go. Um, and that kind of goes on for a while until you are allowed to leave. <laughs> and um, I got some numbers here. Sorry, I have something in the chat. So I'll let uh, Molly take it while I look at the chat here. Okay, so she's got numbering in, in, um, in the language that she learned. And then you'll also see Hausa, 
uh, one through 10 and also French. So I'm more familiar with the French, un, deux, trois, cap, cinq, six, sept, huit, huit, neuf, dix. And then the Hausa, I recognize some of it, but I didn't, I didn't use it a lot, um, but I do recognize some of it. Um, Daya, bi, uku, hudu, beer, and on down. So I'll let her do her Bamako, uh, excuse me, um, language. Okay, yeah, so I just thought it was quite interesting to see that these all look completely different and French really was a lingua franca across that strip of West Africa, excuse me, because it was all colonized by France for about what, 60 or 70 years. Okay. Um, and it is um, the official language, it's the language of government, it's the language of education. Yep. I think they're trying to move more away from that because it's a colonial language and some, you know, um, locals or especially um, indigenous intellectuals uh, don't want to have to keep using the colonizers language because of this whole idea of the colonization of the mind and that you're um, you're not able to really be your authentic self because you're using this imposed language. Anyway, I'm getting off track, but um, I'll, I can recite the numbers in Bamananka. It's Kelen Fla Saba Nani Duru Woro Wolaula Segin Konaton Ta. And um, I didn't look up, they actually have seven vowels. There's two O's and there's two E's. I was trying to find the right symbols to put in here, but I couldn't find them. So you can see that I just copied and pasted the house of ones off Google. So that's how this is. This is a unique kind of D sound, right, Molly? Yeah, I, I don't even know. I just okay. didn't. In fact, yeah, I, I have a, a, too much. <laughs> a funny, funny story. So I, I, the house I was given, this is kind of interesting. The house I was given in my town, Maini Sorowa, came with a guardian and his name is Sumai. And he had, so I'm in this huge four person cement block of a house. And it's got the kind of the um, fencing around it. Um, can't think of the word anyway. And then he's in like this wood hut, like little tiny, you know, on in the same property. I mean, like he is like my guardian, but I've never even met him before. So that was kind of sobering, you know, initially, but he really, um, he took care of me. He helped me. He uh, looked after things for me. And I remember someone visiting me. This was at least a year of the way in. So I had, you know, been there a while and thought I was doing okay language wise and talking to someone in Hausa and they just looked at me like they couldn't understand what I was saying. So Sumai comes over and he translates my bad Hausa into good Hausa. And I understood exactly what he said. And I'm thinking, I just said that, but they understood him, of course, and they didn't understand me. But um, he was a gem and I, uh, it sounds really kind of weird to even talk about that, that this house came with a guardian. And so I don't, I'm not sure if the owner paid him to stay on the property, um, but he truly was a lifeline for me. And he had a farm and, and uh, I got malaria while I was there and was really sick. And he went and got the French volunteer and they took care of me. And so he, he was a gem and uh, I'm really thankful for him. Thanks, Molly. Um, okay, we're getting there. Yes. So um, tea, the tea ceremony, do you want to talk a little about how important tea is over there? Yes, so and I have a teapot to show you as well, kind of shows, um, and I, this one I actually had done with some silver, some work done on, done on it to bring it home, which is a little tarnished, but tea was a big deal, and it's, you know, it's 110 degrees, and people are drinking hot tea, you know, all I could think about was one, it makes it safe because it's hot. Um, and two, it's actually a change from how hot it is. It's actually hotter. You, know, you have like some <laughs> difference of temperatures, but it really, um, she has it down here that it was loose tea and it was this whole process in these little cups, super strong, super sweet. I mean, just thick, um, delicious but there were, you would get three servings out of one thing of tea. And she has the, the um, ceremony part here, the first cup, bitter like life, the second strong like love, and the third gentle like death. So it definitely decreased over the time, but just, it was amazing to watch the, the it was a, it was a, it was an art um, and people had time. And so this was on a break. This is actually the hospital in the background. 
Um, and so he was pouring tea and they could go up so high and it was just a, a fun thing to watch and to be a part of. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, they steep it multiple times. So you take this little pot, like what Molly has and you just stuff it's um, green tea, actually Chinese green tea stuff, a lot stuff it with tea uh, and then often put mint in there as well. And a ton of sugar, you know, people don't get a lot of sweet so drinks will often be very sweet because that's where you can get your sugar um and then they like to pour from that high because they want it to be frothy like this you can see the froth um and what's interesting is that everyone has their favorite serving you know like that you, they'll know that so and so like ojenaba likes the second steeping that's like right in between it's not too strong and it's not too weak um and so people know that about each other so um and then you just sit around and you drink tea. And this is like a little tea setup that this is the guard outside of the archives. And he's just, just for himself, he's got like a little, you know, single serve thing going on. Maybe he can have one friend over here. But I do have to say that that first cup, because it is so condensed, um, yeah. it's so strong that you're almost shaking afterwards from the caffeine <laughs> and the sugar. I did not, I was more like the third one because by that time it's pretty watered down and I can take it. <laughs> Um, so these are men serving. And then this is a picture I have of women because they drink tea too. But again, genders keep, they have pretty separate spheres of existence. And I just love that this woman has her tiny infant on her lap, but she's pouring tea off to the side mm -hmm. here. Um, and then people just sit and visit with each other and drink tea nice. and looks like there's some snacks there. Um, babies passed out, you know, very peaceful and communal. Um, okay, we're getting there. Thank you for hanging. We hadn't done a time check when we did this before. I didn't know we had so much material, but we wanted to talk a little bit about art. So this slide just kind of shows what I think people probably think of when they think of West African art. The kente here is probably pretty familiar. You know, I've seen it pop up in a lot of like Juneteenth um, publicity, and that's very, I think, got adopted um, by African Americans, but that is specifically from Ghana. And the same with these Adinkra symbols that people may have seen, especially like Sankofa here, the bird that is reaching around on its back. And so they're all associated with sayings. And this one is that you have to look back from where you came to see where you're going. Um, and these are the Benin bronzes that come from uh, what is today Nigeria. But so this is, but this kind of art is not what I experienced. And I don't think what Molly experienced in the parts of West Africa where we were. Um, I found the textiles very interesting. So this is, there's three main kinds of textiles there. Um, this is the indigo and all of these are um, dyed onto um, locally grown and woven cotton. Um, so this is indigo, which, you know, people are probably pretty familiar with. There's a real tradition of it over there. This is something that's very unique that is called mud cloth which you can also see over here. And they do use kind of special fermented mud to paint the cloth. Um, and then the one over here, I'm not quite sure what it is because I actually got it in Cameroon and was just told that it was a holy cloth, but I thought it was beautiful. And the one, and so I went over the mud cloth and the indigo. And what I am wearing here is a tie dyed damask linen, which it's not as shiny as it used to be. It's supposed to be as shiny as what this woman is wearing because they literally cover it in a thin layer of wax and then beat it with these wooden sticks so that it's really shiny and stiff like it's starched. And this kind of outfit that she has, mine, mine does not extend to the ground because I didn't have enough fabric, but it would have a skirt that goes underneath it. Um, the, the fabric is expensive. It's imported European linen um, and the, the, the tailoring and the treatment, this outfit probably costs hundreds of dollars. So it's a really big deal for someone to have something like this and to wear it. And um, sorry, Molly, did you? Oh, we have fabric. Don't you have more fabrics to show Molly? I have a little bit, but yeah. um, this is just, you could get, this is called a panya. So it's just a, a wraparound fabric. They were, this is actually some Nigerian money. It was amazing what they put on the fabrics. It could kind of be anything. I found some with actually Christmas trees on it, which I thought was interesting. So they would make the fabric into three-part 
um, pieces, the skirt, the top, and the head head piece. Um, do you want to show yours, Natalie? And then I thought yeah. if you want to, um, I can show my baskets at this point too. That would be great. Yeah, we didn't have a slide. So I have more of these. These are Nigerian made. Um, they call them wax because it's kind of a boutique printing. And I had a lot that I liked. Um, the coolest one I saw, Molly, in terms of weird things on fabrics was like tubes of toothpaste that were like being squeezed. <laughs> so there's just toothpaste coming out, but it looks really, it takes a while to see what it is. And I have one that's just a bunch of keys. I did want to mention too that these um, fragments of textiles are actually, they found them in a cave in Mali and they are, they think from the 12th or 13th century. Um, so these are ancient pieces of cotton fabric that um, they still look very similar to what exists today. And so um, do you want to show your baskets, Molly? Yeah, so I just have, um, the baskets were used for pretty much everything and anything. This one I thought was interesting because it actually shows you know, people and an animal on it. Um, it's a pretty large one. Here's the top, which was you know, many tops I have, but tops could be used for the actual basket or this was actually used a lot for a plate um, to serve things on that were dry, things like that. Um, I have a smaller uh, basket that if this is woven so tightly that you could actually put milk in here and it wouldn't leak out. So that was pretty neat. Um, another little tiny little basket. So those were very common. And then I'll just show this here for the moment since we're in just for some art, like this is out of a calabash. And so just some art oh. that was, um, that was available. <laughs> so. Yeah, I wanted to show too that um, actually, I think I have a whole bunch of stuff, but it, it doesn't work so well to show on it. And, um, but this is again, a gourd that uh, has been made into a container and um, a friend of, and it's got all this beautiful beadwork on it. And a friend of mine there had it made with my um, local name because it's very important for you to have a local name there so that they know um, how you fit in the society because part of that had to do with the last name you were given and so what 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 family or for what cast are you from but um, I use this now to keep my extra cat collars in <laughs> in case any of the cats lose their collars so and uh, leather work was really popular this is something I use every day and it's in great condition it's almost 30 years old. Um, I just keep my credit cards and different things in it. So leather, and then I, I brought some huge things home, some cushions, but here's a little purse um, that was, uh, I used that's leather. So it's very, very beautiful, beautiful work they do. Okay, and I think we're coming up on the last slide here, which I just wanted to show that Again, this is my language teacher, Kasim, um, and he, I don't know, had some relationship, like family relation to this woman whose name is Nakunte Jara. And she is the one who made this bogola, this mud cloth that I have, and she's a renowned, pretty famous artisan. Um, here she is actually creating the mud cloth. You can see the, the mud over here. Um, this is her family compound, and she had laid them all out. And I think I actually bought this one off of the ground there. It's not as fine as these, but it was affordable to me. And um, I believe that her mud cloth is actually on display in the Smithsonian Museum. So um, that was really cool to be able to see her doing that because I think it's something where um, it's probably a bit of a dying art because it's just cheaper to get printed fabrics, especially um, from China now. China provides a lot of cheap goods that people can afford to use uh, over there. Um, and that's it. So thank you so much for sitting with us. I didn't think that we'd be talking for so long, so I apologize for that. Um, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now so that if anybody wants to ask questions or anything, that they are welcome to do that. So let me, where do I do this? Stop recording.